Welcome to Whiskey and Sunshine Off Grid. I'm Scott. And I'm Shelly. <laughs> Back there behind the camera today. Today we're going to try something a little different. Hopefully some of you have seen our videos that we've had to, before about our solar power setup here at, at the house. Because of a lot of that, I was asked to be on a forum, I guess you could call it, on social networking that was for basically solar power for beginners. Kind of trying to help people how to understand how everything works and the realities of it. And I got a lot of interesting questions. Well, we got a lot of interesting questions from from people. This is definitely geared towards the layman. I don't want to try to talk over anybody's head. There's a lot of that out there on the internet already anyway. So I'm going to try to make my answers as simple as possible. And I'll try to explain to you what some of these questions actually meant ahead of time. But uh, before we get too far into the technical ones, I think the first question I'm going to tackle uh, is about solar power in general. I know everybody's power bills have uh, gone up by at least a third, some have doubled. And since that's happened, I've been getting a lot more questions about solar power. Understandably. Um, one of the biggest questions is, is solar power cheaper than regular grid power? So I'll just start right there and say most of the time, no, it is not cheaper. Grid power, it's, uh, it's there. And all you have to do is pay a bill and you pretty much are only limited by the amount of money you can pay on that bill. If you want to leave your lights burning all night long, that's your choice. You can use as much as you want. It's like an endless supply for the most part. However, when you get into solar power, it's like having a bank account. All the power that you put in your battery bank is just like putting money in the bank. So you take out a few nickels and quarters here, and hopefully you put back in dollar bills on the other end. And that keeps your batteries charged. Keeps your tank full, so to speak. So hopefully that comparison will help you, except for the fact to know that anytime you're getting involved in buying solar equipment that's big enough to power your whole house or to actually live on, you're talking about a substantial investment. You could be talking about tens of thousands of dollars and it'll take a long time in making those monthly payments before you get to the point where it's going to start going the other way. So everything is kind of cost prohibitive and it's also prohibitive as far as your time frame goes. So, uh, conceivably, you may not be alive long enough to see the gains and the free power from your system. So it depends on what you want to do. This person writes, I'm very interested in cutting down on my power bill with solar. The salesmen are all trying to talk me into a grid tied system. Will that still be able to power my home if the grid power goes out? Is it even cost effective? Because I've also heard that solar power by large is a scam. How do I find out what I need and who do I ask? Well, there's actually several questions involved there. Right now, I'm sure you guys have all seen all these solar farms that have been being put up. Um, I don't know, different parts of the country, maybe they're already there. Maybe they're putting up more. I don't know. But I'm talking about these areas where there's hundreds, if not thousands, of panels standing in uh, an area that used to be a farmer's field or in a place that used to be forest land or a parking lot or whatever they are. And generally to get the power from those panels that are owned by a separate company other than your power company, you would have to join what's called a co-op. And that's a lot like a farm co-op where you, at the beginning of the year, give the farmer a certain amount of money or pay him so much a month, he uses that as operating expenses and to pay bills. And then in turn, you get his product at a reduced price. These solar co-ops are supposed to work the same way. And I think that part of the situation is a good idea. Because you don't need to change anything in your house. You can literally make a few phone calls, tell somebody, yes, I want it. 
You can get hooked up with a co-op, start paying a monthly bill, which more than likely will be less than your regular power bill. And you'll be saving money right off the bat. However, I have noticed a lot of these new solar farms that are being put up, they're not giving a great attention to detail as far as what they're doing. Just like with the windmills, I think a lot of this stuff is being done so that the developers can get all the tax break money for building the wind, uh, the solar farm. I almost said wind farm because it's pretty much the same angle. So they're getting money from the government to help them construct it. So they're getting a good deal there. They put the stuff in fast. They put it in in a hurry. And a lot of times they put it in wrong, in my opinion. And what they're going to do is once they get it up and operating, the company that put it there is going to turn around and they're going to sell it. So they're going to make money again. And then you'll be dealing with whoever that person is that buys the solar farm. So you kind of have to pay attention to what's going on. Now, what I would do different, in their cases, I see an awful lot of solar arrays that are set up at a fixed angle. The panels are sitting right on the ground. Up here in the Northeast, that's a bad idea because usually the whole bottom row of panels is buried in snow, so you're not getting any power out of those. And they're not going to clean them out. They're just going to sit there, and their excuse is, well, you don't get that much power in the winter anyway. Well, you could get a lot more if you had those cleaned off. They also don't put the panels high enough in the air. And now that could be because they don't want people seeing them up 10 to 12 feet in the air. And it also could be because they're being lazy and cheap. But if they were up there in the air, that would allow the snow to slide off the panels, still leaving the panels clear to produce their optimum amount of energy. In a perfect world, they'd be out there in the spring and the fall changing the angle on those panels to make sure they get in the peak amount of electricity that they can. And most of the solar arrays that I'm seeing set up are not even adjustable. So they kind of set them to the basic latitude of where the solar farm is. So you're halfway in the middle between the spring and the fall angle and they leave them alone. So it's a good idea I think it's a great idea, and I think in the long run, it would really help us towards being, you know, having better, less expensive electricity. And I think it would be better for our environment, too. However, like with everything else, I think the entrepreneurs out there are taking advantage, and there's going to be a lot of money made off from this stuff, and it's going to end up falling on its face. I, I hope not, but that's what it looks like to me. Same thing happened with the windmills. Sad. It's really sad. But off from my little political tree stump there. Now let's talk about the uh, grid tide system where they came out and they want to uh, put panels on your roof. And their whole sales pitch is you're going to make so much power, you'll be selling power back to the power company. Which is true. It is true. But uh, there's a lot to it. Within that contract, it probably says that until your system's paid off, the solar company gets all or at least a part of the revenue from you selling the power back to the uh, power company. And you're going to find out that the price that you pay per kilowatt is a whole lot higher than the price that you get paid per kilowatt when you sell it back to them. You may or may not even have to pay income tax on that money. So there's another catch there. Other states vary. You will not have power for the most part if the grid goes down, even if you've got a whole solar array on your roof. Unless you have means to store that power and use it as you see fit, the only power you'll have at any given time is what your panels are making. So you might be able to have a little bit of power during the day. Once the grid is down, you're disconnected from the grid. But you're only going to have the power that you're taking in right then. You're not going to have, you're not going to be able to run, you know, microwaves, air conditioners, heaters, fans. You're not going to be able to do that. You might be able to run a few lights because that's the kind of power you'll have. But as soon as the sun goes down, gone, you're out. Unless they get the grid back up and going again. So you're still grid dependent. 
Uh, there's, again, there's a lot of tax breaks involved in those systems. A lot of times the solar company also keeps that tax break for themselves because technically they own the equipment. If it takes you 20 years to pay off your equipment, those panels have already started to degrade at like 5% a year after, I think it's 20 years, something like that. The solar companies and the power companies are the ones that are going to be making the most money. Um, you can pat yourself on the back and talk about how you're energy independent. Probably make your bill go down some, but you're still kind of getting into bed with some bad characters, in my opinion. I, I'm not saying all solar companies are like that. It's hard to find a good, honest, reputable solar company. Uh, try to find one that specializes or at least deals in off-grid systems. If they start trying to discourage you away from having a battery bank, find out why. Um, a lot of them... I'm going to tell you, well, it's just easier to have grid tie, and it is, it is, it's a lot easier and it's a lot cheaper to just have grid tied. But uh, you're not going to be power independent and you're not going to be able to run your whole house when the grid goes down. It's, that's a fantasy. So that's the answer to that question.